The diversity of Jewish communities is a testament to the richness of Jewish life. In North Africa and Europe, Jewish communities have made profound contributions to the societies in which they have lived, enriching their cultural, economic, and scientific landscape for centuries. However diverse these communities may have been before the war, they all shared a similar fate during the Holocaust. Meet seven survivors from Southern and Eastern Europe who described their journey from the ghettos to the horrors of Auschwitz. Rolanda Donner was born in 1923 in Salonika, Greece. With its Jewish community of 50,000, Salonika was an important center of Sephardi life before World War II. Rolanda's family spoke both Greek and Ladino. In 1941, Salonika was occupied by Nazi Germany. On nous a mis dans un ghetto avec les toiles, pas longtemps, parce que les trains nous ont amenés, ça a pris peut-être des semaines jusqu'à Birkenau. Toute ma famille était prise. Vera Vertez was born in 1928 and grew up in an assimilated Hungarian-speaking Jewish community in a small town in Hungary. When the Germans occupied Hungary in March 1944, all the Jews in her town were concentrated in a ghetto. When the Germans came in, as probably you know, we had to leave our home. They gave us a few hours and we had to pack the little belonging and we were sent to the ghetto. And I must tell you that it was so sad that nobody, nobody was helping us. Even our best friend, Christian friend, didn't help. Clara Forayi was born in 1928 in the small town of Gunst, Hungary. A month after the German invasion of Hungary, Clara and her family were forced to move into the Košice ghetto. After a very short time in the ghetto where we were placed in Jewish homes, uh, five uh, families into a home, we were taken out to a brick factory that was set up right on the railway. And that's where we stayed for about four weeks. And on the 26th of May, 1944, again we were put on the train. Sarah Kleinplatz was born in 1924 in Pabianich, Poland. She grew up in a family that spoke both Polish and Yiddish. When the war broke out, the family fled to Lodz and was forced to move into the ghetto. So when the time came, as I said, started liquidating the ghetto, everybody tried to hide. Everybody tried, so we when they emptied our block, we ran to another block. They emptied the other block, we ran to another block. And that was going on for about three, four nights or six nights. I don't remember how long. Then we, we eventually, they caught up with us, the Germans. And they cut us and they brought us to a train station. And they loaded us into those train trucks. If everybody got, got assurance that we're going to work and everybody got uh, have a loaf of bread or something with some jam. Born in 1911 in Warsaw, Poland, Aline Marzak grew up in a Polish-speaking family. The family spent two and a half years in the Warsaw Ghetto. During the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, Aline and her mother were hiding in a bunker for weeks. Les Allemands, ils nous ont découvert. Ils nous ont trouvés. Ils avaient peur de rentrer dans le bunker. Ils ont mis les gaz. J'étais très malade, j'étais un petit soquet. J'étais un des derniers qui l'ont sorti de cette bunker. 
on nous a déportés ensemble. On a passé quelques jours à ce fameux Umschlagplatz. Leon Calderon was born in 1926 in Salonika, Greece, and grew up in a Ladino-speaking family. In 1943, after being confined in the ghetto for two months, Leon and his family were deported to Auschwitz. Well, it was the station, the railway station, there it was a Jewish community also there. It was uh, many houses in that area, and it was all Jewish people. So they started to evacuate, and one, two transport, three transports, till they finish all that area. So, and remain all the houses empty now. We arrived there, so the house, it was empty, and everybody took a house, and we entered inside. We stayed there another two, three weeks. It was uh, nearly a time for uh, Passover at that time. 1943. 1943. And uh, it comes the time, they say, okay, everybody on the line, so we go to the station. We go to the station now, and uh, the trains, it was those uh, cattle uh, trains. They were waiting there. So they open the doors, and they fill it up. Enzo Camerino was born to Italian-speaking parents in 1928 in Rome, Italy. In 1943, the Germans occupied the northern and central parts of Italy, and within a few weeks, they started rounding up and deporting the Jews of Rome. The 16th October, five o'clock in the morning, somebody knocked on the door. My father go open the door. He say, one Italian soldier and one German soldier with a piece of paper. He tell him prepare a suitcase, food, jewelry, money for a, a day uh, trip. He prepared this merchandise, what he tell. He, he take us downstairs, he got the, he got a truck, he waiting for us. He bring it to us to the military academy in Rome. He stay there for four or five days. He have to bring it to the station. He put in a wagon, you know, the animal wagon. Cattle car. Yeah. We were uh, put in the cattle car on the 26th of May with the German SS talking to us at the railway, telling us to be calm, everything will be all right. And as the train pulled in and we were lined up at the cattle cars, that was supposed to take about 44 people. 86 of us was pushed into a car, and of course there was no room for uh, sitting down. So if we wanted to sit, we had to sit on top of each other. There were babies, there were small children, and very old people. It was so dark in the uh, cattle car. It was uh, the door was locked on us, and the window was just about a foot, uh, a square foot uh, size very little air and it was very hot in the car and as soon as we started out as the train pulled out children started to scream they were they they were afraid in the dark and they were asking for water and they were asking for food and there were two old men in the car who felt very sick and they were, they were also begging for water but there was no water and there was no food that uh, two old men died and we were traveling with the two dead men in the cattle car for the rest of the journey i think that of all my experiences in auschwitz or in in all the concentration camps this first uh, experience the, the, the uh, ride to Birkenau to Auschwitz was the one of the most horrible ones I will always remember. We arrived toward dusk on some train trucks and this stopped and the train stopped and we looked out one was pinning on top of the other to look out through those little um, windows that were with with uh, bars but to see where we are 
we didn't know what they're doing. I stood on the shoulders of my sister and looked out and I saw deep down when, the, when, the, when it was breaking dawn, I saw thousands and thousands of people kneeling without any hair in some stripes uniforms and somebody was going around with a, a stick, you know, how do you call those sticks? Baton. Baton. And hitting them over the heads. And I said, so, said to the others what I see. And they said, must be some kind of an asylum for, for uh, insane. Uh, insane asylum or something. Because the screams were terrible. And on one side we heard music playing. Music was playing like anything. And here we hear screams. We didn't know what's doing. Toward the morning, they opened the doors. We arrived in the plants around 12 o'clock at night. And nobody knew where we are. Just they opened the doors in the night with lights there. And all of a sudden, they start, they heard some dogs, and they started to shout, Laos, 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 Laos. My grandmother was taken away, and she was crying after me, and she was screaming, Where are my dear child? Where are my dear child? And I just heard her scream by two SS soldiers was taking her away, and then we went and I saw lo so many barracks and so many uh, electric wires, huge fences, and bare, everything was bare, no grass, no, no nothing. It was a terrifying place to go. When we came to the, to the washrooms, to the, to the shower rooms, there was one big large hole where we all got undressed and we were staying in the nude. I didn't know if the showers would let out gas because from Helm and I knew that instead of uh, water is coming gas, what that Adela told me. And um, we saw those shower rooms and we didn't know what will come. And we got the showers and they sprayed us with some very sharp disinfectant or something. I don't know, I know it was burning like hell. We were dressed as they wanted. Ils nous ont mis des... Vous savez que les bottes que j'avais, ils m'ont aidé beaucoup à vivre. Parce que des fois, il faisait chaud, des fois, il y avait la, la boue là-bas et tout ça. Et après, ils nous ont mis des souliers n'importe comment. Everybody, he become uh, stranger. Because everybody was with the hair and everything. And all of a sudden, you are without hair. A tall person, he took a short uh, pants uh, or a short uh, jacket, another one long, and so on. So he become uh, transformed. The people, he, it was so much degrading. We were not told anything. It was late at night, and we were allowed maybe two hours to rest and then we were led out and had to line up and wait for the SS to come and count us. And even then, we had no idea where we were, what was going to happen. And after about three hours, he allowed us to get up and go into the building. And this is when we found out from the girl who was in charge, a Polish Jewish girl of about 21, who could barely walk because her feet were frozen. And she told us that you are in Birkena, this is an extermination camp, and if you see the smoke, the smell of which we smelled as soon as we got off the train, it was a sickening smell. Those are your fathers and mothers and small sister and small brothers. This is exactly the words. All day we felt the smell. This is unbelievable. This was the most dramatic thing. The smell of the burning bodies. Of, of, of what's going on in the crematoriums and everything. It was just unbelievable, unbelievable. And we were afraid day and night, afraid. We were so scared, we were so scared, what's next? I, I didn't mind dying, but I didn't want to die in a gas chamber. I didn't want to go into a crematorium. I, 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 if I, I could do, my, my little sister, the youngest one, she was begging us, let's go over the, the wires around were electrified. Let's go over, let's finish it. Let's not wait till they finish it off. Let's, and my mother said, no, maybe one of us will have a chance to survive. We can't do it. Sarah spent a year in a displaced persons camp where she married. 
The couple immigrated to Canada with their son in 1950 and had two more children here. Sarah was a passionate Holocaust educator who believed in the importance of passing on the memory of the genocide. Rolanda spent several years in Paris after the war. There, she met her husband and they had two children. The family emigrated to Canada in 1951. Vera returned to Hungary, married a fellow survivor, and had a son. The family fled Hungary during the 1956 revolution and settled in Montreal. Vera and her husband, who could not go to university before the war because he was Jewish, worked hard to support their son in realizing his dream of becoming a doctor. Clara returned to Hungary in 1946. She married and had a daughter. The family fled to Canada in 1956 and settled in Vancouver. As a survivor speaker, Clara shared her story with countless students. Aline Marzak never returned to Poland. After spending time in Sweden, France, and Brazil, she came to Montreal in 1954. After liberation, Leon returned to his native city, Salonika. He immigrated to Montreal in 1955. He eventually set up his own real estate company and started a family. Enzo returned to Rome in 1945 and got married. The couple came to Montreal in 1957 with their son and had a daughter. Enzo opened his own hardware retail store here. He did not dwell on his Holocaust experience, but looked forward in life and had a very positive attitude. 